Hello, and welcome to Story Starters with Dubuque County Library. I'm Miss Kayla, the children's librarian at the Dubuque County Library. And today I am going to be reading from the book, A Wish in the Dark by Christina Suntornvet. A Wish in the Dark, Chapter One. A monster of a mango tree grew in the courtyard of Namwon Prison. Its fluffy green branches stretched across the cracked cement and hung over the soupy brown water of the Shaktana River. The women inmates spent most of their days sheltered under the shade of this tree while the boats glided up and down and up again on the other side of the prison gate. The dozen children who lived in Namwon also spent most of their days lying in the shade, but not in mango season. In mango season, the tree dangled golden drops of heaven overhead, swaying just out of reach. It drove the kids nuts. They shouted at the mangoes. They chucked pieces of broken cement at them, trying to knock them down. And when the mangoes refused to fall, the children cried, stamped their bare feet, and collapsed in frustration on the ground. Pong never joined them. Instead, he sat against the tree's trunk, hands crossed behind his head. He looked like he was sleeping, but actually he was paying attention. Pong had been paying attention for the tree to the tree for weeks. He knew which mangoes had started ripening first. He noticed when the fruit lightened from lizard skin green to pumpkin rind yellow. He watched the ants crawl across the mangoes, and he knew where they paused to sniff the sugar inside. Pong looked at his friend Somkit and gave him a short nod. Somkit wasn't shouting at mangoes either. He was sitting under the branch that Pong had told him to sit under, waiting. Somkit had been waiting an hour and he'd wait for hours more if he had to, because the most important thing to wait for in Namwon was, were the mangoes. He and Pong were both nine years old, both orphans. Songkit was a head shorter than Pong and skinny, even for a prisoner. He had a wide round face, and the other kids teased him that he looked like those grilled rice balls on sticks that old ladies stole from their boats. Like many of the women at Namwon, their mothers had been there because they'd been caught stealing. Both their mothers had died in childbirth, though from the stories the other women still told, Somkit's birth had been more memorable and involved feet showing up where a head was supposed to be. Pong wagged his finger at his friend to get him to scoot to the left. A little more, a little more, there. Finally, after all that waiting, Pong heard the soft pop of a mango stem. He gasped and smiled as the first mango of the season dropped straight into Somkit's waiting arms. But before Pong could join his friend and share their triumph, two older girls noticed where, what Somkit held in his hands. Hey, did you see that? said one of the girls, propping herself up on her knobbly elbows. Sure did, said the other cracking scab-covered knuckles. Hey, skin and bones, she called to Somkit. What do you got for me today? Uh, uh, said Somkit, cradling the mango in one hand, embracing himself to stand up with the other. He was useless in a fight, which meant that everyone liked fighting him the most, and he couldn't run more than a few steps without coughing, which meant the fights usually ended badly. Pong turned towards the guards who were leaning against the wall behind him, looking almost as bored with life in Namwam as the prisoners were. Excuse me, ma'am, said Pong, bowing to the first guard. She sucked on her teeth and slowly lifted one eyebrow. Ma'am, it's those girls, said Pong. They think they're going to take... And what do you want me to do about it? She snapped. You kids need to learn to take care of yourselves. The other girl, guard snorted. Might be good for you to get kicked around a little, toughen you up. A hot, angry feeling fluttered inside Pong's chest. Of course the guards wouldn't help. When did they ever? 
He looked at the women prisoners. They stared back at him with flat, resigned eyes. They were far past caring about one miserable mango. Pong turned away from them and hurried back to his friend. The girls approached Somp Kit slowly, savoring the coming brawl. Quick, climb on, he said, dropping to one knee. What? said Somp Kit. Just get on. Oh, man, I know how this is going to turn out, grumbled Somp Kit as he climbed onto Pong's back, still clutching the mango. Pong knew, too, but it couldn't be helped. Because while Pong was better than anyone at paying attention, almost as good as, as some kid at waiting, he was terrible at ignoring when things weren't fair. And the most important thing to do in Namwon was to forget about life being fair. Where do you think you're going? asked the knobby-elbowed girl as she strode towards them. We caught this mango fair and square, said Pong, backing himself and some kid away. He sure did, said her scab-knuckled friend. If you hand it over right now, we'll only punch you once each. Fair and square. Just do it, whispered Somkit. It's not worth it. You don't deserve it just because you want it, said Pong firmly. And you're not taking it from us. Is that right, said the girls. Oh, man, Somkit sighed. Here we go. The girls shrieked and Pong took off. They chased him as he galloped around and around the courtyard, with Somkit clinging onto his back like a baby monkey. You can never just let things go, Somkit shouted. We can't let them have it, panted Pong. It's ours. He dodged around clumps of smaller children who watched gleefully, relieved not to be the ones about to get the life pummeled out of them. So what? A mango isn't worth getting beat up over? Somkit looked over his shoulder. Go faster, man! They're gonna catch us! The guards leaning against the wall laughed as they watched the chase. Go on, girls! Get him! said one. Not yet, though, said the other guard. This is the best entertainment we've had all week. I'm getting tired, Pong huffed. You, you better eat that thing before I collapse. Warm mango juice dripped down the back of Pong's neck as Somkit tore into the fruit with his teeth. Oh man, I was wrong. This is worth getting beat up over. Somkit reached over his friend's shoulder and stuck a piece of mango into the corner of Pong's mouth. It was ripe and sweet, not stringy yet. Paradise. Chapter 2 Later, as they lay on their backs next to the river gate, Pong tried to remind Somkit how great that mango had been. The sun had started to set, and their golden brown cheekbones and shins were turned, were turning the same purple color as the sky. Somkit touched his bruised cheek and winced. Why do I have to be friends with such a loud mouth? Pong grinned. Because no one else will be friends with you. Somkit reached over and flicked him on the ear. Ow, said Pong, scooting away. You know, between the two of us, you've actually got the bigger mouth. And you'll notice that I keep it shut around the guards and mean kids, said Somkit. Sometimes you have to go along with things if... Sometimes you have to go along with things if you don't want to get mashed into a pulp. Don't you? But you? You just... Never know when to shut up and let things go. I know, said Pong, folding one arm along under his head. But we earned that mango. Stupid that we even have to wait for them to fall. The guards should just let us climb the tree. It's almost like they want us to have to fight over them. He put two fingers on the bone in the center of his rib cage. Stuff like that, I don't know, which just makes me mad. I get this burning feeling right here. That's probably gas, said Somkit. Look, next year those stupid girls will turn 13, and then they'll be out of here. We'll be the oldest ones. We can eat our mangoes in peace. Children born at Namwon were released when their mother's sentence was up, or when they turned 13, whichever came first. But Pong didn't care about the girls' release date, 
if anything, it was just one more bit of unfairness that those two would get out first. It see, it would be four more years until Pong and Sam Kit turned 13. Four years felt like forever. Pong turned his face from Sam Kit and looked past the bars of the river gate. Namwon sat a little upriver from Chatana City. From here, Pong could just see the lights starting to come on, one by one by one thousand, until there were two cities, one on the shore, one in the water, both made of light. Normally, at this time of night, the two of them would take turns sharing their dreams about what sort of life they'd lead in the city once they got out, the food they'd eat, the boats they'd buy. Some kid would have at least three boats, one to live on, one to fish from, and one speedboat with a custom motor that would be good for nothing except driving ridiculously fast. Pong liked to picture himself as a grown man with a good job and a full belly, lounging the back of that slick speedboat with some kid at the wheel. A single orb of glass swung from the mango tree overhead. Its dim violet glow couldn't compete with the bright blaze across the river. Compared to the city, Namwon was like a cave. Was it a wonder that life wasn't fair for them? How could fairness find its way to them through all that darkness? But once they got out, under those lights, life would be different. They would eat mangoes they didn't have to fight for. When they asked for help, people would listen. Some kit turned onto his side with a groan. Ugh, every bone in my body hurts. You've got to promise me to lie low. At least until after next week. What's next week? Somkit rolled his eyes and shook his head. You'll sit and listen to mangoes for hours. You can't even hear what people are saying when they're standing right next to you. Didn't hear the cooks today. The governor is coming here next week for an official visit. Pong sat up, ignoring the ache in his ribs. The governor? I know, said Somkit, licking his lips. We're actually going to get some decent food for once. The cook said they're going to grill a bunch of chickens. But Pong couldn't think about food. He was thinking about the guest. Most people in Chatana looked up to the governor. After what he'd done for the city, how could they not? The man was a hero. But to Pong, he was even more. Pong had only ever seen a portrait of him in a textbook. But even from the picture, he could tell that the governor was someone who would understand him. He would care about the unfairness at Nam Wan. If he knew how things were, he'd change them. That's just the kind of person he was. Someone who made things right. Pong's wild and secret wish, the one he didn't tell even some kid about because it sounded so silly, was that one day he'd work for Shatana's great leader. He imagined himself standing at the governor's side as an assistant or an advisor, or whatever sort of jobs grown people had. Together, they would make everyone's life brighter. The fact that the governor was coming to Namwon for a visit couldn't be just a coincidence. It had to be a sign. It had to mean that one day Pong's wish would come true. Hey, said Samkit, snapping his fingers in front of Pong's face. I've got that funny look of yours right now, and I don't like it. Listen, you've got to promise me that you're going to keep your mouth shut from now on. No more trouble, okay? He leaned closer and bugged his eyes out. Okay? Pong squinted at the city, making all the little dots of light blur into one. Okay, he said. No more trouble. At the time, it seemed like a perfectly reasonable promise. Chapter 3. Nock crossed her fingers behind her back as she watched her father clean his glasses for the hundredth time that morning. He was nervous, she could tell. Warden Sivapan was supposed to be in charge of everything and everyone at Namwon, and Nock wished that just for today he could play the part. Nock, whined her little sister Tip, I am going to die in this thing. Tip stuck her finger into the high, frilly collar of her blouse and pulled it away from her windpipe, snapped back against her throat with a thwack. Tip's twin sister, Ploy, giggled. Stop fidgeting, 
said Nock. She straightened Tip's collar, then poised Sash. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves, whining on a day like this? At least the twins got to wear short sleeves. Nock tugged at the cuffs of her itchy dress, fighting the urge to scratch her arms. She longed for the loose comfort of her spire fighting uniform. In her opinion, any clothes you couldn't throw a punch in were stupid. But of course she wouldn't complain, especially not today, the day of the governor's visit. Nock's mother glided towards them, an older version of the twins in pale blue silk. All right, she said. Everyone ready? Remember where I told you to remember what I told you to say. No embarrassments today. Got that, everyone? Nock's older brother smoothed down his hair. That's fine for us, he whispered. But who's gonna tell dad? Nock glared at him. Her mother snapped her fingers, and it was time to go. The twins followed Nock, who followed their brother, who had come home from university just for this occasion, who followed their mother, who was really the leader of the family, but who walked behind her husband to keep up appearances. The family lined up near the river gate in the shade of the big mango tree. The prisoners were supposed to be standing in orderly lines too, but the children had run up to the gate to wait for the, the, wait for the governor's boat. I feel sorry for them, whispered Ploy, slipping her fingers into Nock's hand. We have to live in a jail. Isn't that awful? It's not a jail, said Nock. It's a reform center. Nock and her siblings hardly ever visited their father's workplace. That morning, Nock had made a point to show her sisters the official Namwon Women's Reform Center sign on the front gate. But the truth was that no one ever called it anything but a prison. Why can't Daddy just let them all go? asked Ploy. Her twin leaned closer. You know what Mama says. Trees drop their fruit straight down. Huh? I'm not talking about fruit, dummy. I'm talking about kids. Nock sighed. She means that you can't expect children to turn out very different from their parents. And those children have criminals for parents. It's best to keep a close eye on them. Besides, where else would they go? Some of them are orphans. They'd have to live on the street. At least they get good food and they go to school here. They're happy here. The children did not the children did look happy, or at least excited. Nock noticed that only two of the boys weren't pressed up against the gate. One scrawny boy with a moon round face stood on his tiptoes unable to see over two girls who seemed to be blocking his view on purpose. His friend, a boy with thick hair that stuck up at the top, also hung back near the trunk of the mango tree. He wasn't looking at the gate at all, but up into the branches. The boy tilted one ear up at the low-hanging fruit, almost as, as if he, almost as if he were listening to it. How weird, thought Nock. Who listens to mangoes? Here he comes, the other kids shouted. The governor's boat, I can see it. Nock's mother snapped her fingers and hissed. Places, to your places, now. The governor's barge glided toward the prison dock, its teak paneling, its teak paneling gleaming in the sunlight. Swags of white flowers swished from the prow. A soft whir churned the water behind the boat as it swiveled into place at the dock. A glass orb the size of a watermelon hung suspended over the silver prongs of the barge's motors. Its jade light glowed so bright that it made spots float over Nock's eyes when she blinked. The river gate swung inward. Uniformed guards disembarked and stood at attention. Nock glimpsed the sheen of the governor's robes, and then her mother snapped her fingers again. The prisoners pressed their palms together and dropped to their knees. Nock bowed her head, her stomach flipping somersaults. Was this really happening? If the kids from school could see her now, they would burn with jealousy. She was about to meet the man they all idolized, the hero they learned about in history classes, whose proverbs they had memorized since nursery school. In just a few seconds, Nock would meet the man who would save their city from the brink of destruction. It was a story that every child in Shatana knew. 
Long ago, Chitana was the city of wonders. Giants as tall as palm trees waited in the river while singing fish schooled around their ankles. In the floating markets, vendors sold all manner of magical treats, pears that made you fall in love, cakes frosted of good luck, even a rare fruit shaped like a sleeping baby that would let you live for 1,003 years if you ate it in a single bite. The people lived blessed lives. Wise old sages traveled down from the mountains to share their wisdom, heal the sick, and grant wishes. But most of all, in Chitana, they all they had all they could wish for at first. The city prospered and grew. The houses stacked on top of each other higher and higher. The canals became crowded. Unfortunately, magic doesn't like a crowd. As Chitana swelled, the wonders thinned away. Shy giants wandered north and never returned. The singing fish were netted for rich men's dinners. Bakers became fro began frosting their cakes with plain sugar. It was cheaper than luck, just as sparkly, and the wise sages stayed on the mountaintops. At first, the people of Chitana didn't mind. They were successful and too busy to care about those old-fashioned things. The city spread wider, buildings rose higher. There was more of everything, but it still wasn't enough. Greed made people careless, and that was a mistake. No one knows how the great fire started. In one rainless night, the City of Wonders became the City of Ashes. Every building and nearly every boat burned. Chitana had always been isolated from its neighbors, but the destruction was so great that no one could have helped them anyway. The few who survived the great fires suffered miserably. The sun seared down during the day, and at night there was no shelter from the drenching rains. Disease spread. Fights broke out over what little food remained. The people missed the wonders then. They despaired. Sure that the end was near for all of them. But somewhere among the ruins, there must have been one luck frosted cake left. Because out of the forest came a man who carried magic that no one had seen in more than a century. That one man turned everything around. He brought Chitana back to life. Chapter 4. Nock kept her head bowed, but she couldn't resist popping one eyelid open. The governor walked past her, leaving the scent of lemongrass trailing behind him. Another snap from Nock's mother, and the prisoners sat back on their heels, palms still pressed together at their chests. Nock blinked, hardly able to believe that she stood just a few yards away from Chitana's greatest hero. He looked ordinary. Nock didn't know what she'd been expecting. It's not like he would be floating in a cloud or anything like that. But the man standing before them could have been any man. He was taller than her father, but not by much. His face was smooth and pale, the color of milky tea. He smiled briefly as her father greeted him, and only then did faint age lines appear at the corner of his eyes. Her father seemed in awe of him, too. Or maybe he was just afraid of messing everything up. He could hardly meet the governor's eyes as he stepped forward and cleaned his glasses yet again. This is a very special day for us all, her father announced. His grace, our governor, honors us with his presence. As you know, his grace gives such thought and care to your reform. We are... The warden looked down the line of prisoners, and his eyes became glassy and sad behind his spectacles. His voice drifted off. Come on, Dad, you can do it, Nock thought, willing him to gather up his thoughts. Nock's mother cleared her throat softly. We, we are blessed to have you with us today, Your Grace, her father stammered. He was supposed to give a longer speech, but he must have forgotten it. We will now serve the meal, after which my wife has planned entertainment in your honor. Nock's mother smiled stiffly. She flicked her fingers at the kitchen staff. Nock's nostrils filled with the smell of garlic and meat. 
The cooks carried big steaming pots out of the kitchen to the tables under the pavilion. They set the pots on top of metal stands that cradled crimson orbs to keep the, the food bubbling and hot. The prison children all perked up. The moon-faced boy even licked his lips. Doc wished they wouldn't look quite so hungry. The prisoners bowed, then made an orderly rush to the pavilion. Doc herded the twins behind their brother to wait their turn to be introduced to the governor. She told herself not to be nervous. After all, she'd been practicing what to say to him for weeks now. As she waited, her eyes wandered to the boy with the sticking up hair. He had been near the front of the line, and he was already slurping up the last bits of food from his bowl. She tried not to stare, but she found her eyes drawn to him. He seemed so different from the other children. He looked around, taking in everything. He stared at the governor intensely, though he kept a respectful distance. Suddenly, he turned his head and then stood up and hurried towards the boy with the round face, who had tears running down his plump cheeks. A full bowl of chicken and rice lay spilled on the ground at his feet. Two older girls stood beside him, cracking their knuckles. The boy with his sticking up hair strode up to the tallest girl and without a word stomped on her bare foot. Knock gasped. Knock! Her mom, her mother snapped. She turned to see her family staring at her. Even her father looked mortified. With a flush of embarrassment, she realized she was supposed to be greeting the governor at that very moment. Knock's practice speech flew right out of her head. Her cheeks burned as she bowed. I'm very sorry that I was distracted, Your Grace. It's just that... Just that what? asked her mother, impatience edging her voice. Knock pulled down the cuffs of her dress. It's just that... I think that boy over there is fighting. Her mother's lips parted, horrified. What boy? Knock pointed him out. The older girl was howling now, clutching her wounded foot. Knock's mother stormed towards the children. You there, she said to the sticking up hair boy. What do you think you're doing? The boy froze. Oh, ma'am, I, well, I just saw, you saw that we were busy, so you thought you could misbehave, hmm? No, ma'am, is it isn't that. You see, these girls? The girl he'd stomped on wailed and hopped on her good foot. Hush! snapped Mrs. Sivapan. You dare to start fights on a day like this. She looked ready to swallow the boy whole. His spine straightened. Not couldn't believe the way he was looking at her mother, as though he was right and she was wrong. My friend had been waiting for his food, said the boy, and they, how dare you talk back to me? The governor glided around the boy and spoke in a deep, smooth voice. Allow me to handle this, Madame Sivapan. The entire courtyard hushed. Doc's mother patted down her hair and stepped back to make room for him. Thank you, Your Grace. The boy swallowed and wiped his palms against the sides of his trousers. He bowed to the governor. When he raised his head, he had a hopeful, almost happy look in his eyes. The prisoners and staff had inched closer to see what was going on. Everyone pretended to eat as they leaned forward, listening. Is it true, child? asked the governor. You were fighting? Your grace, it is the greatest honor to finally meet you, said the boy breathlessly. I know that, I know that of everyone. You will see that. Tut, tut, the governor chided. Now is not the time for flattery. It is time for truth. Tell me, did you hurt this girl? Yes or no? The boy stood, wide-eyed, with his mouth open. He nodded. Do you know why I'm here? The governor asked. To, to make sure we're being treated fairly? The governor stared at him for an uncomfortably long moment. I am here to remind you all of the price of breaking the law. Tell me, child, are the nights dark here in Nam Wan? The boy nodded. As they should be, said the governor. Chitana is a city of light, but that light must be earned. That is why I had to had this reform center built here, away from the city. 
to remind the people that wickedness has a price. You see, light shines only on the worthy. The boy continued staring speechless as the governor took a half step back. He raised his arms, palms up. The air grew thick the way it does before a storm. The hairs on Nock's arms stood on end and her scalp tangled. Everyone in the courtyard seemed to be holding their breath. A pinprick of light appeared in the governor's palm like a hovering firefly. It shone brighter than brighter still, swelling to the size of a marble. The little light of the ball was blindingly bright, even brighter than the orb that powered the governor's boat. But it didn't seem hot. If anything, the courtyard felt a little cooler than it had a moment before. A chill raced up the back of Nock's neck. She had grown up surrounded by the governor's magic, but few people ever got to see him actually use his powers. She shivered, thrilled and frightened at the same time. The man may have looked ordinary, but he was far from it. Everything in Shatana, every orb, every cook stove, every boat motor, all of it ran on the governor's light-making powers. Once he arrived, there was no more need for fire, no more danger. The orbs lit the night. They powered magnificent machines. They had made Chitana prosperous again. The city had transformed in more ways than one. The governor hadn't just made light. He had made laws. Chitana had become a city of rules, the city of order. Now there would never be another great fire. The people would never have to suffer like that again. The governor reached his other hand into his pocket and drew out a glass orb, clear and thin as a soap bubble. Light shines on the worthy, he repeated, placing the orb into the boy's hands. All others fall into darkness. Tell me, child, do you want to remain in darkness forever? The boy's throat bobbed as he swallowed. He shook his head. The governor closed his fingers over the light in his hand and touched the glass orb. The air between him and the boy wavered and crackled. A second later, everyone in the courtyard gasped. The governor's hand was now empty. The light had traveled into the orb, filling it with, gold, with a gold glow. Trapped inside the glass, the governor's light was still bright, though a little less raw and frightening than it had been a moment before. Tell me, said the governor, will you be a good boy from now on? The boy stared at the light in his hand, speechless. Nock realized this may be the first time he had ever been this close to a gold orb. Nock's mother stepped forward. He will, your grace. We will see to that, of course. She turned to the boy. I hope you appreciate his grace's generosity for him to give you that light. And gold light, no less, is a kindness I'm not sure you deserve. But please, your grace, allow us to convey your, gr our gratitude to you with a song we have prepared in your honor. She clapped her hands overhead, and the, sig the signal for the women prisoners to break into the number they had rehearsed for this occasion. The small courtyard rang with the sound of their voices. Doc's mother beamed. Her siblings smiled perfect smiles. Everything was back on track and going smoothly. All eyes were on the governor, who bent down to whisper some last comforting words to the wayward boy before turning to watch the prisoner's performance. But Nock was watching the boy. He stood staring at his palm. The hopeful, happy look had left his eyes. The orb in his hand had gone dark. So I will stop there. And again, the book that I read from today was called A Wish in the Dark by Christina Suntornvat. And we have this book at the library. So if you'd like to check it out and see how it ends, um, stop by one of our Dubuque County Library branches and pick it up. Um, also, if you want to join us ever for one of our live story starters, um, you can register at our website, that's www.dubcolib.org, 
and that's on Wednesdays at noon. You can join us for live story starters if you like. Um, you can also register for our other programs that we've got going on, all of them virtual for the time being at our website. So hopefully see you around and hopefully you enjoyed the story for today. Bye.